Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Lynn Holtain. I'm the Executive Director of the Victoria Law Foundation. It's an enormous pleasure to be with you today. We are joining you from Wurundjeri country and we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands wherever you may be joining us for this conversation with Rob Hulls, the former Attorney General of Victoria. Rob was the AG from 1999 to 2010, which is an ex extremely uh, sound innings as uh, the first legal officer of Victoria. And during that time, he instigated some remarkable reforms, many of which have been long sustained in Victoria and have become part of the legal landscape of this state. And we'll talk about them uh, in a moment or two, the establishment of what have become known as uh, the specialist courts. So Rob Hulls, it is an enormous pleasure to have you with us. Thanks so much for your time. Great to be with you, Lynn. Pleasure. So today we want to talk about the establishment of the specialist courts, and we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to talk a little bit about the backstory, about how you got to a point where you thought specialist courts were an appropriate response in Victoria, because you had a fascinating legal journey before that. But take us to Mount Isa and what sort of impact that had on you as a young lawyer. Lynn, I always wanted to do law because I saw law as an opportunity to really change the world. I mean, the justice system is a key part of our democracy mm. and it's important that the justice system works properly. Um, so I wanted to do law, represent disadvantaged members of our community. Um, and marks weren't good enough to get into law. Um, but I wasn't going to be put off by that. A lot of doomsayers said, Halsey, give up on that idea of doing law, mate. You're not smart enough. Um, there was a law course at RMIT at the time where you actually worked in a lawyer's office during the day and went to lectures at morning, in the morning and at night time. And I um, wrote to uh, RMIT on a daily basis as a kid, begging for them to let me in. And finally, they said, stop writing to us. Stop stalking us. <laughs> uh, if you pass uh, your first year of arts, there'll be a place for you in law. And I did and um, was privileged enough to do my law course and finish it. Uh, and I thought, I want to use it for social good. So I worked for legal aid in Victoria for a while. And then I decided to take myself outside my comfort zone. Saw a job advertised working with an Aboriginal legal service in Mount Isa. Never met an Aboriginal person in my life. You know, came from a um, sort of a, a white middle class background. I thought this will be something different. Um, I'll do it for 12 months and see how it goes. Uh, applied for the job, got it, and ended up staying in Mount Isa for eight years. Uh, five of those years doing Aboriginal legal aid work. And to be frank, Lynn, it changed my life. It changed my life. After studying law, um, what I learnt in law school did not prepare me for what I saw in outback northwest Queensland. I saw a justice system that was racist, that was unjust, um, that was jailing uh, our First Nations people at extraordinary rates. So it really changed my life. So tell us a bit more about that. I mean, tragically, so many of those stats are still the case in terms of incarceration rates for First Nations people. But what about that experience then prompted you years later as uh, the first legal officer of Victoria to instigate a, a more tailored response, specialist court. What did you see there that was failing so dismally? Well, let me give you a couple of small examples. When I arrived uh, as the new lawyer to do Aboriginal legal aid work, I go to a welcoming barbecue and a police officer said to me, oh, you're here to do the Aboriginal legal aid work. I said, yes, looking forward to it. He said, mate, if I was to tell you that last night in the Mount Isa Watch House, there was an old Aboriginal bloke arrested for being drunk. I said, he'll be one of my clients. I'll represent him to the best of my ability. Then the police officer said, no, you need to understand that whilst he was lying on the floor in the watch house asleep, the officer in charge of the watch house went up to him and force fed cockroaches down his mouth as a bit of a joke. And I was aghast and the police officer said, so your reaction, one of disbelief, is the same reaction the magistrate will give when the accusation's made in court. He won't be believed, the Aboriginal bloke, but it happened. This sort of thing happens up here on a regular basis. You need to understand the sort of justice system you're coming into. And by the way, I'm leaving town, I've had enough. I wasn't sure if he was trying to frighten me um, or not, but I found out pretty quickly that that's the sort of justice system I was coming into, where Aboriginal people were treated as fifth class citizens. The justice system was not tailored uh, to meet their cultural needs. Um, Another example, I'm sitting in the back of the court waiting for my case to come on and there was a coronial inquest taking place, an investigation into a death. 
um, a car, single vehicle collision, hit a tree on the side of an outback road. The only witness was an old Aboriginal man sitting beside the road. He was called into the witness box to give evidence about what he saw. He looked around and he saw all the white faces in court. And you know what he said? He said, I'll plead guilty. Mm. He hadn't been charged with anything. I almost had tears running down my eyes thinking, does our justice system really understand how culturally insensitive it is to First Nations people? So it was those types of experiences that made me realise that if I, if I ever had the opportunity, I had to try and change the law, change the justice system to make it far more culturally appropriate, far more culturally sensitive. So one of the specialist courts that, that you established is the Koori Court in Victoria. We have also the Assessment and Referral Court, also known as the ARC, which deals with people with, with mental health issues. There's the Drug Court, there's the Family Violence Specialist uh, List, and there's also the Neighbourhood Justice Centre in Victoria. But it, it was really the, the issues around First Nations justice that prompted this zeal in you as AG, is that right? Uh, yes, my experience in Mount Isa um, led to uh, doing the Aboriginal legal aid work for five years, realising that I could fight cases on a case-by-case -case basis, but if you really want to change the system, you had to become a lawmaker. How mm. do you do that? You've got to run for parliament. And I did, as a 33-year-old kid up in North Queensland, after five years of Aboriginal legal aid work, I ran for federal parliament. I'd never been to parliament house before, Lynn, but... Uh, I got elected, like <laughs> right place, right time, got elected and um, then got beaten at the next election um, and moved back to Victoria and politics was in my blood and I wanted to continue to try and make laws that could ensure the justice system was a positive intervention in people's lives. I took a pretty simple view and that is People's lives will go along a certain track, Lynn. They might have ups in their lives, you know, they might fall in love, they might get their first job, their first car or whatever, and then there could be down times in their life. You know, they, they might have a death in the family. That could lead to mental health issues, drug and alcohol issues, family violence issues, long-term unemployment issues, and at that horrible stage in their life, they might come into contact with the justice system. The view I took was, when they do come into contact with the justice system at that stage, they can either be pushed further into the mire and it can further ruin their lives, as it did with many First Nations people in North Queensland, or the justice system could act as a bit of a trampoline and help bounce their lives back on track. And that's the sort of view I took, that's the sort of justice system I wanted to try and create, one that was a positive intervention in people's lives. That's a remarkable reframing of the way in which most of us understand criminal justice in particular, that it is a force for good and not for something that is about crime and punishment. The old crime and punishment model, I think, has well passed its use by date. Um, locking more and more people up does not make us safer as a community. Yes, there are some bad people out there that need to be um, you know, locked up and some for a long period of time, but the majority of people who are coming before our justice system have a whole range of issues that haven't been dealt with at any stage in their life, whether it's mental health issues, family violence issues, um, drug and alcohol issues. And unless we address the causes of why people are coming into contact with the justice system, we'll just continue to create this revolving prison door where people go in and out of the prison system. I mean, for instance, about 90% of women in our jails have themselves been victims of family violence or sexual assault but we lock them up. What sort of society does that? You know, um, pe people, many, many people come into contact with our justice system because they're addicted to drugs mm. or alcohol. We're not treating the addiction, we're just treating the offence. So these specialist courts are all about putting holistic services around people, trying to address the underlying causes of why they're coming into contact with the justice system with a view to ensuring that they actually don't have any further contact with the justice system down the track. That saves us all as a community. It saves money, um, you know, it means we, we don't have to build more and more prisons which cost a fortune and don't reduce recidivism, recidivism rates and it helps people get back to productive lives where they can contribute to the community. So let's talk a little bit about how a specialist court works. I mean they're all slightly different um, in their ways in which they respond to the, to, the, uh, to the groups that they are particularly targeting or focused on. 
but they all have that holistic approach that you describe. Tell, tell us a bit more about how that works in, in offering people that trampoline out of, out of a potential grim future. Sure, look, I, I don't think it's rocket science. I think it's just a sensible approach. If a person is coming before the court uh, and they have mental health issues, and as a result of those mental health issues, they're coming into contact with the justice system. They might be stealing from a shop, uh, for instance. They might be having a psychotic episode and they might assault somebody in the street. Um, we can either lock them up and warehouse them in our jails and just ignore those people as human beings, basically. Or when they go to court, we can have mental health workers, we can have social workers, we can have a whole range of support systems to assist them the day they go to court. Um, family violence, for instance, is a huge issue in our community. For far too long, the police uh, and other um, parts of the justice system treated family violence as a mere domestic dispute. Um, well, it's far, far more important than a mere domestic, um, and we have to address and put holistic support around women who are reporting family violence. Mm. For too long they were reluctant to report it because the police weren't taking it seriously. Now, with the family violence courts, there is holistic support, counselling, social work support for people who are reporting family violence. The same with uh, the, the drug court, for instance. Um, you know, people can get appropriate assistance, can get rehabilitation, um, can get support for their drug addiction when they go before the drug court. Um, and that ensures um, that their contact with the justice system is positive, it helps get their lives back on track, um, and they become contributors to society, um, uh, and that's what they want to become. Mm. What about those people who say, okay, we need equality before the law, everybody needs to be dealt with fairly and, and uh, in, a, in a universally um, consistent way, and some people get access to extra support, holistic uh, court processes, and others don't. So how does that maintain confidence in the system? The, the specialist courts that I set up were originally set up as pilots. Um, and it was always my hope that the lessons we learned from those holistic problem-solving courts could be mainstreamed right throughout our court system. And to some extent, that is happening. Um, the Koori courts, uh, originally, there are only a couple, now they're right around the state. Um, and indeed, they're in other jurisdictions, like the county court, for instance. Um, mental health support is available far more widely in our court system than it was when I first set up the mental health courts. Same with uh, family violence uh, holistic support. Um, everybody is entitled to have the holistic issues that bring them before the justice system dealt with by the justice system. Um, and I'm hopeful that um, down the track, every court is a problem-solving court. Mm. Every court has these supports attached to them because only then will the justice system truly be that positive intervention in people's lives. Let's talk about the outcomes because people also have concerns that, oh, you, you went to the specialist court and you got an easy uh, time of it. You know, you got a lesser sentence or punishment than you might have if you'd actually appeared before a magistrate's court uh, as per normal. So what are the outcomes like for people who go to the specialist courts and how do they differ from what happens in regular court? When I set up um, many of these courts, uh, you're right, people would say, oh, it's a soft approach, um, you know, namby-pamby, sort of uh, pathetic uh, approach. Uh, people should be locked up, you know, they should be punished. The old crime and punishment model is the best model. Um, going before some of these courts um, is tough. It's tough on the causes of crime. Um, it's tough um, being accountable for what you've done. Anyone who sat in the Koori court will realise with Koori elders there um, putting a cultural perspective around the person that's going before the court but actually explaining to the defendant um, how inappropriate their conduct was, particularly as far as their First Nations brothers and sisters are concerned, it's tough. Mm. Um, it's a lot easier in some cases to be anonymous, go before uh, the normal adversarial court, plead guilty, get in, take the penalty, and then ultimately get out. Being fully accountable for the underlying causes of why you're coming before a court is tough. 
very, very tough. And some of the programs that people are put on, in, for instance, the, the drug court, mm. um, can go for a couple of years. And you are accountable and you come back before the court on a regular basis and you're monitored by a judicial officer on a regular basis. That's tough. That's not an easy approach, but it works. All these courts have been independently assessed and they work. And that's why they are now a permanent part of the DNA of the legal landscape here in Victoria. And that's a good thing. And if people fall off that program, and I know this um, having watched the alcohol um, and other drugs court, the, the drug court in particular, if you don't uh, make your dates, see through your programs, actually address your, your addiction, then you fall back into the mainstream system, is that right? Well, it's, it's often called a carrot and stick approach. Um, the carrot is that um, if you adhere to the, uh, the drug treatment order and you attend your counselling and you do the urine samples on a regular basis and you stay in the housing um, that um, uh, has been allocated to you, uh, that's the carrot and you'll stay out of jail. But we know that people who have drug addictions will from time to time uh, fall off the fence um, and um, try drugs again. Mm. There is the option for a judicial officer um, if a person falls off that fence uh, uh, on a couple of occasions to impose a short, sharp jail sentence to remind them that that could be the ultimate penalty um, if you continue to um, uh, not adhere to court orders. So it's a carrot and stick approach. Uh, it's based on research. Um, it's based on other jurisdictions that exist around the world. And this approach works. Um, and so um, I, I think this holistic approach where you can use the justice system for social good uh, should be adopted um, right around Australia. Um, and I would be encourage other jurisdictions to look at some of the specialist courts that exist here in Victoria um, and certainly establish them um, in their jurisdiction. Do we need more? Oh yes. Look, there's no question that, um, as I said, uh, every court should be a holistic problem-solving court. Unfortunately, what ha often happens at election time uh, in any jurisdiction is you'll see politicians standing on the front steps of Parliament House with their law and order baseball bat in their hands saying, vote for me, my law and order baseball bat is bigger than hers or, or his and I make no excuses, you know, we're going to lock more and more people up. All the evidence shows that that doesn't work. It doesn't make us safer as a community. And it's not just me saying that as a former Attorney General. The Independent Ombudsman uh, in our state a number of years ago produced a report that says locking more and more people up without addressing the causes of why they're coming into contact with the justice system does not make us safer as a community and indeed is very expensive. It's extremely expensive to put people in jail. Um, I, I think the latest figures were something like $140,000 a year. That money is much better spent for early intervention programs, for holistic approaches that address the causes of why people are offending. There's a whole other discussion in um, rates of incarceration and recidivism and, and the uh, correctional industrial complex that, that sits behind that, which we don't have time for today. But I just want to push you one more step because talking about the, the crime and punishment baseball bats that we see on a regular electoral cycle, it is sometimes the psychotic episode which prompts a very uh, appalling crime which then triggers that kind of reaction. So to go back to the mental health response, if you like, in specialist courts, are there some cases that are just too egregious? to be dealt with in that way? Um, I, I think that, uh, as I've said, there are um, community expectations um, and our justice system. And, you know, it's important that as best it can, the justice system meet those community expectations. Um, but often what the community learns about our justice system is just what they see on the news at night or read in the newspapers. Um, you know, a person, um, for instance, uh, assaults another person, injures that person, um, they don't hear the backstory. They don't hear that the, the perpetrator uh, is having a psychotic episode. Um, if they knew all the facts and circumstances, um, I suspect 
like me, they would want the causes of that offending to be addressed rather than just warehousing somebody who's had a psychotic episode, committed an offence and then warehousing them in a highly expensive prison where very little rehabilitation takes place. They're not going to get assistance for their mental health issues. Um, we are much better off dealing with those people in a holistic way. That's not to say that um, I don't understand uh, communities' angst when they read about particular cases, but when they know the full facts and circumstances of that particular case, often they are more understanding about the need to address the causes of why that person is coming into contact with the justice system. Now, Rob, together with trying to, I think, make courts look more like the communities they serve and um, uh, address the diversity uh, in our midst, you also made some really significant changes to the way in which you selected people who who stand in judgment. The magistrates, the judges, uh, the people who, who meet out the, the punishment such as it is. In, in your time as Attorney General, you uh, appointed your first female Chief Justice. That was an incredible step forward for Victoria. And we have another one now, I'm very pleased to say. But that was a really important step forward too. In, and I think the democratising of, of um, appointments was important to you. How did you go about that? Took, took a pretty simple view and that is that our judiciary has to better represent the community that it serves and for too long um, our judiciary had been made up of what I used to describe as male, pale and stale blokes. Um, you weren't the only person to <laughs> use that phrase. <laughs> There were, you know, and usually from private schools, uh, there were very few women, very few people from non-English speaking backgrounds. Um, and so I wanted to try and broaden the pool and encourage more people to put their hand up um, for these judicial positions. So I actually advertised. I advertised in our daily newspapers. It had never been done before, seeking expressions of interest. Just to send a message really to the fairly conservative legal profession that um, things had changed and that I, as the new Attorney General, wanted to have a much broader pool, including people from academic backgrounds, um, particularly women, particularly people from non-English non speaking backgrounds. Well, I have to say that the, the, the usual suspects, the male, pale and stale uh, blokes who, uh, you know, um, were the only ones that were appointed up until then, basically, um, they went into a spin over it. They were absolutely outraged, so much so that I got letters and I remember getting a phone call at one stage in my office from a very senior um, male member of the profession uh, ringing me and telling me how outrageous it was that I advertised these positions in our local papers and it had never been done before attorney and it was totally inappropriate and then he said, an attorney pursuant to these ads, I will not be applying for a judicial post. Nonetheless, attorney, if you deemed it appropriate to appoint me, I'd be happy to accept. <laughs> uh, needless to say, that person wasn't appointed. But look, it was, it was just a sensible uh, way of ensuring that our judiciary better represented the community that it serves. I think that, that is a, a, a really useful companion piece to, to the development of specialist courts and to the more uh, um, appropriate context in which in which justice is done but Rob it's been an enormous pleasure talking to you as always thank you again very much for your time and thank you for being with us on Wurundjeri Country today which um, of course was never ceded and we are now uh, at a time when that voice can finally get the airing it deserves going back to your experience in Mount Isa I hope it makes a difference Absolutely. Thanks, for, for, thanks for joining us thank you for your time Lynn pleasure <laughs>